Welcome back to the story of liberty. This is John Bona. I'd like to talk about the great lady, Margaret Thatcher. She was the British Prime Minister, the longest serving from 1979 to 1990. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and the only woman to have ever had held the post. She spent her childhood growing up above a grocery shop. Her dad was a local politician and also a member of the Methodist Church. He served as a local preacher and he brought up Margaret as a Methodist. Margaret attended school nearby in Grantham, a girls' school, and she worked hard and was involved with piano and field hockey, piano recitals, and she liked swimming. She applied herself and studied chemistry at Oxford and initially was rejected, but then offered a place only after another candidate withdrew. And when she arrived in Oxford in 1943, she took on science and obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in 1947. Her political career was launched in 1950, and she ran for a conservative position in the labor seat of Darth Ford, where she attracted media attention as the youngest and only female candidate. She lost both elections in 1950 and 51. Later in 1958, she began looking for another conservative seat, and she found one in Finchley's Jewish area. She regarded the residents of Finchley as her people, and she became a founding member of the Anglo-Israel Friendship League as well as a member of the Conservative Friends of Israel. Regarding Israel, Margaret Thatcher stated, We have to remember that the Jewish people never, ever lost their faith in the face of all the persecution, and as a result have come to have their own promised land, and to have Jerusalem as their capital city again. Thatcher was subsequently appointed Secretary of State for Education and Science. She began to attend lunches regularly at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and it was at these lunches that her ideological movement opposing the welfare state began. She knew how bad Keynesian economics was, and it was weakening Britain. She published pamphlets and proposed less government, lower taxes, and more liberty for businesses and consumers. She made a speech in Kensington Town Hall, which was directly against the Soviet Union. She knew that the Soviet Union was attacking liberty itself. And she said this. She said the Russians are bent on world dominance, and they are rapidly acquiring the means to become the most powerful imperial nation the world has ever seen. The men in the Soviet Politburo don't have to worry about the ebb and flow of public opinion. They put guns before butter, while we put just about everything before guns. Known as the Iron Lady for her stand against communism, Margaret Thatcher became the first woman prime minister of the United Kingdom at a time when England's government was facing bankruptcy just like America is today. Unemployment was on the rise and there were conflicts with labor unions, just like we have. After elected prime minister, she introduced a series of political and economic liberties, initiative to to reverse the national decline. After being prime minister, Margaret Thatcher introduced a series of political and economic liberties, to reverse Britain's national decline. Her political and economic philosophy was simple. Smaller government, privatization of state-owned companies, and the reducing the power and influence of unions. She, with some help, brought the free market back to the United Kingdom, and her popularity grew after the Britain's economic recovery in 1982. Her policies worked. 
Her policies of smaller government, lower taxes, and the privatization of state-owned companies that now had to compete in the private sector, it brought economic recovery. Margaret Thatcher successfully turned the country around by cutting the welfare state down, reducing the union power, and the privatization of several industries. She wouldn't back down. In 1984, I remember, the union threatened to shut down the state-owned mines. She refused to meet the union's demands. And when she became to the point where it was do or die, she compared what they were doing to the Falklands conflict two years earlier. She declared in her speech, we had to fight the enemy without in the Falklands. We always have to be aware of the enemy within, which is much more difficult to fight and more dangerous to liberty. Did you hear that? She was saying that the enemy within was more dangerous to their liberty. Well, after a year on the strike in March of 85, the union conceded without a deal and Margaret Thatcher won the internal battle for liberty. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were political allies. They thought alike. He called her the best man in England. She once said he was the second most important man in my life. Ronald Reagan was president for eight of the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's 11 years in office. She was the first foreign leader to visit Reagan after his inauguration in 1981. And their strong rapport helped transform the world. Ronald Reagan had a higher claim than any other leader to have won the Cold War for liberty. And he did it without a single shot being fired. Thatcher said, morning after Reagan's death, he was one of my closest political and dearest personal friends. To have achieved so much against so many odds and with such humor and humanity made Ronald Reagan a truly great American hero. Both politicians had convictions. They were united in certainty about their anti-communist free market views. They believed that the free market should loom out under the voice of the people. Their personal and political rapport helped their conservative outlook triumph around the world. It certainly was a triumph over tyranny in the 1980s as the Soviet Union crumbled. There is no doubt that Margaret Thatcher's privatization of state-owned companies and this association with marked improvements in performance, particularly in terms of labor productivity, created a new Britain economy. It's called competition. See, Margaret Thatcher knew, just like Ronald Reagan knew, that the government was too big. And if the government did not have to compete in the private sector, the government could just veil out there, do what it wanted, sluggish, have huge losses, and go on and on losing money, like our post office in America and other things our government runs, accumulating debt, providing poor service and products. So she made them compete with other companies in the private sector, in the free market enterprise. And they improved. They brought economic liberty to the free enterprise market during her reign. And this is exactly what America needs today. We need to determine the proper function of government under our Constitution. Then we need to determine the improper function of government under our Constitution. And then we either privatize or we abolish all the programs under the improper function of government. That's what we need to do to balance our budget. That's where we need to begin. Margaret Thatcher knew these things. And she offered great advice to America when she visited. She said the biblical basis affects one's whole view, attitude, and outlook. She continued, it isn't merely about democracy and liberty. It's personal liberty with personal responsibility. Responsibility to your parents, to your children, to your God. 
This really binds us together in a way that nothing else does. If you accept freedom, you've got to accept the principles about that responsibility. You can't do this without a biblical foundation, she said. So there you have it, folks. The Iron Lady, a great lady, a great woman of God, who at the same time was the leader of the free world with Ronald Reagan as president of the United States. That's the kind of leadership America needs. That's where we need to go back to. God bless you. However, challenging, and that is that over her 11 years, the gap between the richest 10% and the poorest 10% in this country has widened substantially. How can she say at the end of her chapter of British politics that she can justify many people in a constituency such as mine being relatively much poorer, much less well housed, and much less well provided than it was in 1979? Surely she accepts that is not a record that she or any Prime Minister can be proud of. Mr Speaker, all levels of income are better off than they were in 1979. But what the Honourable Member is saying is that he would rather the poor were poorer, provided the rich were less rich. That way you will never create the wealth for better social services as we have. And what a policy. Yes, he would rather have the poor poorer, provided the rich were less rich. That is a liberal policy. Yes, it came out. He didn't intend it to, but he did. I give way to the the honourable gentleman. I'm extremely extremely grateful. The the, the Prime Minister is aware that uh, I detest every single one of her domestic policies and have never had that. I think that the Honourable Gentleman knows that I have the same contempt for his socialist policies as the people of East Europe who have experienced it have it for that. I think I must have hit the right nail on the head when I pointed out that the logic of those policies are they'd rather have the poor poorer. Once they start to talk about the gap, they'd rather the gap was that. Down here. Not that, but that. So long as the gap is smaller, so long as the gap is smaller, they'd rather have the poor poorer. You do not create wealth and opportunity that way. You do not create a property-owning democracy that way. The night was to prove almost a love fest. Ronnie and Maggie, Dennis and Nancy, first names all. Few could remember two world leaders putting on quite such a show of affection for each other. Bow-tied Secret Service men in hot pursuit, most of the American government in attendance as the Prime Minister gave vent to her sentiments. This evening, Mr. President, I've no such inhibitions about being complimentary about everything about the United States. We in Britain think you are a wonderful president. (laughs) And from one old hand to another, (laughs) welcome to a second term. And alas, I cannot imitate this wonderful American English accent. You ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) Based on the career that I once had before this one, You are a very tough act to follow. (laughs) Listing previous Anglo-American double acts, the president sought to add another. Thatcher and Reagan. Then, with a cigarette for one, a slice of pudding for the other, the lights dimmed to end these somewhat extraordinary proceedings. A British embassy breakfast followed this morning with most of the Reagan cabinet. It was back to serious business and the two subjects that have dominated this visit the ever-strengthening dollar versus the pound, and arms control, the Star Wars controversy. Mrs. Thatcher supporting only the concept of research. 
we simply had to do some research. The Soviet Union, I think, has been ahead in some things. The Soviet Union has been ahead in lasers, in electronic pulse beams. It's got an anti-satellite capacity, none of which the West has got. And so, on our fundamental strategy of deterrence and balance, the United States had to embark on a considerable research program. If it should result in possible deployment of weapons, then the anti-ballistic missile treaty provides that there must be negotiations. At a news conference which followed, American interest focused on Mrs. Thatcher's view of the Russians and a problem on the other side of the world, New Zealand Premier David Longy's refusal to allow American ships with nuclear weapons aboard into his harbors. Mrs. Thatcher made it clear she would be most angered by any similar action against British ships. I am as disappointed as you are in the approach taken by the New Zealand Prime Minister. He's very much aware of my views, that all our ships are seconded to NATO. At any moment's notice, they might have to be asked, instructed to take up NATO positions, and therefore they must carry whatever is appropriate to their NATO task. And I have no intention whatsoever of revealing whether or not a nuclear armory is part of their weaponry aboard any particular ship. And therefore, either they must not ask whether they're carrying them, or must accept that if they ask, we will not say. I shall be very disappointed if Royal Naval ships cannot visit New Zealand. The people of New Zealand are very close to the people of Britain. And I think they will be disappointed too. Then it was to the last formal engagement, this time with Transport Secretary Liz Dole, a possible future candidate for president. And that should have concluded Mrs. Thatcher's visit to Washington, but for bad weather in England, detaining her plane on the ground here. Mrs. Thatcher herself sees her visit to Washington as having been a considerable success, and certainly she's demonstrated a very special relationship with President Reagan himself. The old Anglo-American special relationship has flowered too, as it always does when a Prime Minister visits the United States. But it's when they've gone that the problems seem to arise and Britain returns to being just another country rather a long way away. John Snow, ITN, Washington. <laughs>